Welcome everybody to the South Point Baptist Church, kind of, sort of, you're out there, I'm here, but we are together in the Lord. We want to worship the Lord today, of course, as we did on Easter, we wanted to do what we did on Easter just to make it as special as we can. We're going to kind of continue that with uh, some more singing this week. Brother Lynn is going to lead us with Betty's help. Enjoy. the glory great things he hath done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the Dead, and he is Lord. 
we do welcome you. Thanks for tuning in. We, we want this uh, broadcast to be a blessing to you. If you're coming to us, Facebook, our Facebook page, our internet page, uploaded to YouTube, southpointbaptist.org. We're so glad that you were here. Last week was Easter. Brother Nick, uh, we had quite a few announcements. We don't really have that many today. Let me just suffice to say we want to give a praise to one of our deacon families, Bill and Deb Livingston, traveled to Houston, Texas. Their oldest daughter, Laura, Laura had a child, Henry Ryan Gregory. Uh, she had Henry on Friday, and so far, so good. Everybody is doing good, mother and child, and of course, Bill and Deborah out there to kind of help with things. It took a little bit for them to get out there with the travel restrictions, but they are safe and sound, and they are happy that God has blessed their family with a grandchild. Easter was a very special day. It's one we will never forget. For me, it was very special. Uh, on Easter morning, uh, my daughter who lives next door, Tiffany, she came in and she said, Dad, I need you to come outside and I need you to, to uh, be halfway dressed and uh, take a look. I can't tell you what's going on, but something's fixing to go down. And so I did, and uh, on the front lawn, uh, to my great surprise and joy and happiness, I think 17 cars of church members, many of them from uh, Brother Gary Stiles Sunday School class and other Sunday School classes, I think college and career came by, and they had a little Easter parade. We have about six South Point families that live in our Pottsburg Landing neighborhood, and with signs and honking horns and... Uh, with the kids kind of looking out windows. They had a little parade in our little subdivision. It was noted by our neighbors and uh, they were very impressed and certainly on Easter Sunday made a great impression. Here is just a little clip that, uh, uh, that was taken of that day. Oh, he's risen. Oh, they rode on the car. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. We, we get it, Nick. We love you. Love you. Oh, love that. Oh, look at Julie. Happy Easter. Oh, man, I love you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I, I certainly did. Well, we're going to have some singing. Uh, and uh, Ron and Sherry, of course, have sung uh, up here many times, and they're going to bless us with another special.
for our Bible reading. We're reading in the book of Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. We're reading from the King James Version. I'll give you a moment or two to look it up. Okay, I think we should be ready. So let's start, chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the highest powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Now let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all your love, your mercy, your grace, and your blessings. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are. Thank you for listening to prayer and answering prayer, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, during these trying times, let us remember that you're always there for us to comfort us and that we can reach you through your word and through your, uh, prayer, Heavenly Father. Please give us the confidence that you're going to take care of us, Heavenly Father, because you did promise that if we are a child of God, you will take care of us. As we go into this coming week, Lord, I pray you'll be with us. Lead God and direct us. Protect us from harm, Heavenly Father. And as a pastor goes into his message this morning, Heavenly Father, I pray you will use him in a mighty way. You will bless him in a mighty way. You will give him the words to say that will bring comfort to everyone and that will reach the lost people and they will accept Jesus. Again, just thank you so much for loving us and taking care of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So appreciate all those that have done a little extra to kind of make this possible for us. Uh, thank you, Brother Gary, for that scripture reading as well. We are in the passage that Brother Gary led us in, and, and I chose Brother Gary to, to lead us in that. 36 years in law enforcement, 13 Jacksonville Beach Police Department, and 23 with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. and. Um, it is very appropriate. We are in uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And the title of my message is The Powers That Be. The Powers That Be. And it is a takeoff uh, on the first verse in the book of Romans. And, and it, is a, it, is a, it is a phrase that is used even in our modern culture. And there's a reason I chose that. And the reason I chose this message is because we see our government in the forefront, especially in these days of the pandemic and the crisis. They've been front and center more uh, than any time in recent memory, in part because almost daily, either our president, governor, or mayor has a press conference to give us the update on the COVID-19 outbreak. Our mayor, Governor and President are seen quite a lot. They've had to be and they need to be there. When we elect our political leaders, we, we certainly expect some things from them. While this is a public health crisis and the government can't solve all of our problems, certainly they are tasked 
with keeping civil obedience by the citizens of our community as they bring resources together to help those that are the most disenfranchised in this, in, in this time that we're going through. And it is a different time like we've never seen in our lifetime. Does the Bible address what a government should and should not do? And does it address our attitude and response to it? The answer is yes and yes. Scripture does. Scripture speaks to secular government. Now, regardless of your political viewpoint, and I am a political conservative, uh, and your pers or your personal viewpoint uh, for the believer, the, the trump card should be the Word of God. And yeah, you notice how I said that. The trump card should be the Word of God. In other words, what we should go to to form our political opinions is the Word of God. Does Scripture speak to the balance of government control and individual freedoms? For me, the answer is yes. A key is found here in Romans. Now, if, if again, we went through this when we were in the early part of Romans chapter 12, when I gave a Romans strong guide to commitment, to gift uh, uh, giving, and all of that uh, messages that we had back October, November. Chapters 1 through 11 of Romans are highly doctrinal, deeply doctrinal that explain in detail the plan of salvation and God's plan of the ages. Chapters 12 through 16 are highly practical. That does not mean that chapters 1 through 11, which is highly doctrinal, doesn't have good practical passages. Of course it does. And it doesn't mean that chapters 12 through 16, doesn't, which is highly practical, doesn't have uh, doctrinal content in it. Of course it does. We, we know in chapter 12 some things, and as, as it moves into that practical uh, section, it, it gives us some guidelines. R. Kent Hughes, in his commentary on Romans 13, says this, Having shown that the laws of the Christian life govern the, the believer's spiritual relationships with God and its social relationships with men, it now speaks to its secular relationships with government. And, 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 and thus, God also how, uh, teaches us how to take that doctrine that we know about the Christian life and living the Christian life and how we handle that in our relationship with him, with other people, and with secular organizations like human government. I want to give you, I want to give you three things this morning uh, in the message, and that is the right of government to exist the rule of government to enforce, and our role as believers to obey. Let me say it again. The right of government to exist, the rule of government to enforce, and our role as believers to obey. Regardless of your political viewpoint, you've always got to go to Scripture as your foundation and basis for how you view the world around you. Let's talk about the, the first part here, the right of government to uh, exist. Look in verse number one. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, three simple things here to me, and that is this. It, it, does human government have a sanction by God to exist and the answer is yes they they exist from god first part of the verse one is sort of a thesis statement we are to be subject to higher powers we are subject we know to the higher power we are subject also to higher powers those above us if you will in certain realms of our life and the ultimate power almighty god and god is the ultimate power that statement is so basic, but in society today, it is so ignored. So let me just say this. You aren't the end-all, do-all of your fate. And, 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 and government is not the end-all and do-all of your fate. But it plays a vital part of it. Uh, this is a command, if you will. 
a command to do something, a command to be subject to something. We are subject to God and subject to the institutions that he has allowed to exist in this world. What are we to be subject to? God and government in that order. The first one is God. There's no debate over this. If he says it, then we as Christians should believe it and we should do it. End of story. No questions asked. Period. Point blank. Obey. Ultimate right belongs to God. So it comes from God uh, and it and is handed down. God allows and decrees government to rule in the affairs of men. From verse 1, it is he, God, who gives leadership. He is power and he invokes power on others. God is a God, God of order and organization. And I'm so glad for that. I'm so glad that that's the case because we need order, especially in times like this. Uh, if you ever went to BJ's or Sam's or Costco or Walmart during the, the last few weeks, you know exactly what I am talking about. Now, if we look back on Bible history, we know prior to the flood, man got really bad. He did all kinds of things to the point that God decreed that he, he would flood the world and he would bring judgment upon mankind. Yes, it is a Sunday school story, and yes, it is still true. And yes, no matter what any person tries to tell you, the word of God speaks to history and shares true and real history. It happened. It happened. And if you read the story in Genesis 6, 7, and 8, and 9 going forward, we see after the flood, when Noah and his family got off the ark, he said this in regards to civility among human beings. Chapter 9, verse 5 and 6 of Genesis says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Now this, this was the foundation of what God would begin to put together with mankind, with human government. And it dealt with the worst civil offense one man can do to another, and that is the shedding of blood. Now, human government started, and let me just say, man messed that up too. But because man messes things up doesn't mean that God does away with it. As we see history unfold, we see that God allowed human government to exist in order that uh, he may oversee his creation. Even unjust governments have been allowed to exist. One writer uh, says this, world leaders are in the hands of God and are playing their part under his sovereign administration. This is a great comfort to the heart of the Christian believer, although it may not be to the unbeliever, for it means that God is working in the affairs of world leaders. He holds the world in his hands. He is taking the failure, uh, he is excuse me, he is taking uh, the failure of mankind and still pursuing his sovereign plan. And, and all things, and, and, and God says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that are called according to his purpose. In other words, he raises nations up. He brings nations down. He uses nations to judge one another. That man certainly is sinful and, and doesn't and will not get it right. And it will only be right. We only have a hint of how right it is when Jesus comes and rules and reigns this earth for the millennium. But right now we have government that we are, are under. So what does scripture say? Well, verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, for the powers that be are ordained of God. And let's, let's carry it a little bit further as well. They have the, the, the existence comes from God to government, to the citizens, and we are to be subject to these leaders. Now make, must, make no mistake, in a democratic so, uh, society, leaders are often su uh, uh, subject to us in the sense that in a democratic society, you can vote out a bad leader. 
Verse 1 says every school. We all as citizens, Christian or non-Christian alike, we are to be part of the fabric and organization of government that makes society run. Now let me hasten to say before you jump to conclusions that it is not the role of government for everybody to, to clothe you, feed you, tell you what to do every waking moment. And people that think that government is supposed to do that, they, they are sorely misplaced. Certainly, part of government is to help in crisis, to keep civil obedience. And those that are the most uh, disenfranchised in our society, they are supposed to help. And we are supposed to be a part as believers in the church to help see in that need. We have a calling, but we are to be subject to to that. Now, the government is not some personal ATM machine, as people think, and, and can blame government for all the ills of society, all their ills. No, that's not what government is about. But this crisis is a perfect example for the government to be put to its best use by resourcing materials, organizing infrastructure, and providing help to, the, to those that are the least able of our citizens and to help those that, that are able citizens that are having a tough time. God uses that. Our military, our, our different organizations and our government that help with that. But government is not the end all do all. Thomas Jefferson said this, I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the pretense of taking care of them. So there is, there is that happy, good, honorable balance that God gives government and citizens. Gerald Ford said this, a government big enough to give you everything you want is a government, government big enough to take from you everything you have. And so too much government is, is a bad thing, but no government at all is a worse thing. Our government has a God-given right to function in our society. That right is ordained by Almighty God to that government and, and trickles down to the citizens, by the people and for the people and of the people. But that right has its limits. And in, in the book of Daniel, we have examples in Scripture, and it's a good study for you. In the book of Daniel, we, we had a pagan leader. God will use pagan leaders for good, and of course, the devil will use pagan leaders for bad. But uh, there was a, a leader in Daniel's day that thought he was too big for his britches. And Daniel uttered a prophecy that, uh, that was enacted upon this very powerful ruler who lost his position and almost became like a wild animal, uh, uh, dethroned from his kingdom. But God restored him, and, and in verse 34 of Daniel chapter 4, here, here is what this pagan leader said about God and being subject unto him. <clears throat> and at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Even Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan leader, said, You know, God is still God. While I may have wielded a lot of power, ultimately he calls the shots. So, so there is a right of government to exist. And, and, and on that, we could talk much, but we must move on to the second thing. And a main reason why our government exists, the rule of government to enforce. Verse 2, whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to himself. Um, to themselves. Now, there's the right of government to exist, and there is the rule of government to enforce. And, and verse 2 and 3 and verse 4, and let me read verse 4, talking about those that are in government that God has given 
power to. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now, what does it mean here? Now, one huge role of government is to keep obedience among its people. Now, I use this term because it is a good word in regards to crime and punishment. The key word in our English Bible is resist, to wrongly, to wrong, wrongfully or wrongly resist is to put yourself in a place of punishment. The rule of government to enforce is for lawbreakers. Law, verse 2 says to resist or to break the law brings damnation and punishment. That word damnation, you could also render it and it is rendered in other passages in Romans as judgment. Verse 3 says that a lawbreaker should be afraid of the power of the law. You know, we don't have enough people in this country that are afraid of the law. You should be afraid of the law because you should be afraid of breaking the law and doing that which you know is right. The Bible says that there are two evangelists that we have in our heart. Creation that says there is a God and consciousness that says there is right and there is wrong. And we've got to feed our consciousness with what is right. And God's word can do that and does that. If there is anything that human government is needed for, it is for those who break the law. For a society to function and exist, there must be laws that are adhered to. It is biblical and it is common sense. We know in the last days, and, and we see in societies, there, there's, there's, there's a dictatorship on one end of human government that is absolutely wrong, and there is anarchy on the other extreme of human government that is absolutely wrong. We know in the end times, 1 Timothy 3 tells us the last days, perilous times shall come. And in many ways, because man, this 1 Timothy chapter 3, man will do what he wants to do and thus be willing to break the law. And it says here, despisers of those that are good in that passage having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And I love this passage in Isaiah 5. And this is why government is needed for lawbreakers. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Our leaders, and, and especially, and that's a picture of the United States Supreme Court, they don't always make the right decisions, but they are the law of the land. But uh, that, that passage, especially in regards to those that think it is okay and give a rationale for doing evil and somehow want to twist it and call it good. Ronald Reagan said this, we must reject the idea that every time a law is broken, Society is guilty rather than the lawbreaker. It is time to re restore the American precept that each individual is accountable for his actions, and we are. So what does that mean? Well, we know the word damnation here in our English Bible means judgment. It's used in other places, and there's no escaping judgment if you're going to be a lawbreaker. And if we have committed a crime here on earth, government has the right and has been ordained to rule to find, capture, and render judgment on that crime. Do they always get it right? No, they don't. Do they most of the time get it right? Yes, they do. And because they get it wrong doesn't mean that you do away with it. You work through what we have in our system, the executive, the legislative uh, branch of our governments, uh, as well as the judicial branch in order to make laws better and better. But they are for lawbreakers and thus for lawful punishment. That is why the Bible speaks to the issue of punishment. It speaks to the issue of capital punishment. It speaks to those things in which lawbreakers must pay for their crimes. And, and that is a primary reason that an enforcement, the rule of government to enforce, exists for that. But also, if you look in verses uh, 3 and verse 4, look uh, there in Romans chapter 13. 
it says this, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? And then it says this, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. In other words, lawful praise is, we are, we are admonished to be the best citizens that we can. You've heard me say this, I believe first century Christians were the best citizens in the empire because they did everything they could to, to keep that civil obedience and stuff. They were zealots, yes, and uh, had viewpoints, and they weren't necessarily wrong, but it's the way in which they conducted themselves that Jesus spoke to. And, and, and often, if you read the history books, you, you note that uh, Roman historians noted that many of the Christians were, were well-mannered and kept about their business. And it was only as as the empire got crazier and crazier and the empires got got bloodthirsty for, for, for power to be called a deity that the moral conscience inhibited with them. But, but an admonishment and, and a reason we su subject ourselves is so that we can be good citizens. Good because good is a reward in and of itself. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14 says this, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. Good is its own reward, but good citizens are praised for their good works. And who should our government be praising for good? Should be those that protect our country like our military those who help heal our country, like those that are in the medical profession, those who pay it forward to help others that are trying to be a blessing and help, those, those, those of society. Often, Christians, as a society goes downward, Christians are looked upon, and even at times in this country, looked upon as the enemy. We aren't the enemy. We are the ones that are trying to do good by God's grace, and that is where Isaiah 520 comes into vote. That is why, as you have heard me say, we should pay it forward. We should be a blessing to others. We should do what we can in this. Listen, all of my uh, higher up leaders in government, I voted for them. I wanted them to win, and they won. But, but suppose they hadn't. The mandate would still be to, the same, to respect them for, for what they represent. They represent one of the greatest governments on the face of this planet. And, and we are to do, as First Peter says, and we are to do, as Tim has said, to pray for those. Because who knows what God can do in the heart and mind of a believer. That is why it was so incumbent upon me for us to support our president, who gets enough flack as it is, and our governor, and our mayor, they are in enviable uh, positions. We, uh, we, we, um, we wouldn't want to be in their place because the decisions that they have to make um, in, in unenviable positions really is what they are in. In other words, we don't want their job because it's a tough one. So what can we do? We can be good citizens by praying for them, by supporting them. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to follow the guidelines. This time frame on all this, nobody has the right answer. They're all looking and searching and trying to gather the best data. The, the beaches have just opened. You would say, should they have ever gone? I, I don't know, but I know this. I, I wouldn't have been the one that wanted to have made that decision, but a decision had to be made in the best interest of the people. And so the rule of government to enforce for lawbreakers, for lawful punishment, for law keepers. And we are to be subject. If you're a believer and, and you break the law, there should be punishment for that. There, you, should, you should stand the same judgment. Brother Gary Williams, as I mentioned, that read for us in law enforcement, if, if he were to arrest somebody for breaking in a house and they were to say, hey, Gary, uh, I'm a Christian, Gary would say, that's great, but you're still going to jail because you broke the law. Because the, the government has been ordained by God uh, to, to give rule over civil disobedience. Now, there are exceptions when, when 
when it begins to inflict upon the moral and spiritual consciousness. To me, this crisis was a public health crisis, not a faith crisis. One day, the government may say, if you say anything like abortion is wrong and it's murder, or you, you speak on sexuality that is wrong, then that is hate crime and you can be arrested for it. Then we have a problem because we will say, as Peter told the leaders uh, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we would rather obey God than men. But this isn't a faith crisis here. And, and I, I, I wanted to be a supporter of our government. I wanted to be a witness to our community. And I wanted South Point to be a blessing to the people around us where they can see that, you know, South Point Baptist Church is willing to make some sacrifices in order that we get through this COVID-19 as, as a church and as individual citizens of this great city that we live in. And so I've already kind of shared some of this, but let me give you the third thing, and that is this the role of believers to obey. The right of the government to exist, the rule of government to enforce, and the role of believers to obey. And, 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 and much of it comes down to our attitude toward those in authority. Verse 5, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so this also gives a throwdown to believers to how they should obey. I've got three words there, wrath, wrong, and right. We should obey for wrath's sake, and that simply means we should obey the law because we don't want to go to jail. We don't want to have to stand before a court. I've been in courtroom proceedings as witnesses for people that were going through either civil or criminal proceedings or, or sentencing. And I was an innocent party, though part of the proceedings, and I scared to death because I've never been to jail, don't want to go to jail. So for wrath's sake, Christians should be an example by keeping the law. But it goes further than that. Uh, it is, uh, but also for conscience sake. Now, if a believer is a believer, they've trusted Christ as Savior, inputted into them is great truth. Truth that there is a God, Jesus is Savior, and the Holy Spirit is in you to lead and guide. And from that, you learn from God's Word, things about His Word, how to live your life, your, your spiritual relationship with God, your your social relationship with other people. And boy, haven't we learned this in this new modern phrase, social distancing. Your social relationship with others, but also your secular relationship with human government. And, and we should do it because of, of conscience sake. In other words, we don't want to do wrong. Not just because we don't want to get arrested, but because we don't want to do wrong. Just like you in your heart of hearts when you are closest to God and you say to him, Father, I do not want to sin today. I don't want to sin because I don't want to get in trouble for my sin, but, but I don't want to sin because I love you. And it's wrong to sin. It is wrong to disobey anything that you, you say in your word for me to do and I don't do. And so it is wrong. And, the, but, and then, of course, to be redundant, it is also the right thing to do. Roosevelt said this, the first requisite of a good citizen in this republic is ours is that he shall be able and willing to pull his own weight. There was a dark day in Israel's existence and it was in the book of Judges and I think chapter 17 verse 6 it said something like this, in those days there was no king in Israel but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. 
Everybody has a belief system. Everybody has an opinion. God uses human government to help us in how that we, we bring a foundation of civil rules and laws. Thankfully, this country was founded on Christian principles, regardless of what somebody else may tell you. And while we have strayed from a lot of that, at least those laws are a basis for even, even unbelievers to say, you know, th yeah, I do believe this is wrong and this is right and, and because, because that's what I was taught and, and I know the Bible says that I'm, I may not adhere to everything in the Bible. In other words, what I'm getting at is human government is vital and, and vital in helping bring those laws and helping man to be subject to them. Subject because it's the right thing to do. What are some right things to do? Well, in this passage here, pay your taxes. That was tribute. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Or render unto God that which is God's. The, the, some of you, many of you may be getting those, uh, those stimulus checks. Uh, you're getting them because you paid for them with your taxes. And our, our, our government said, you know, we got to help. We got to help those that are, that are hurting. It may be a, a, a month of pay or two months of pay. And maybe we can't do everything, but we can do something. And because we have a system where people pay in their taxes, we, we, we vote to help them out. And those of you that have already gotten your stimulus checks, that is, that is, the reason, that is one of the reasons government works. Now, uh, the government can't pay for everything. Too much government is, is not good government. There's got to be individual freedom. There's got to be individual work ethic. There's got to be those that strive. That's what made our country great. But the Bible has set up a system of things where to help our society run as it should. And Christians should be the ones to do their very best by God's grace. And unless God intervenes and says, no, you should not do that. They should be the best citizens that they could be. Now, I'm almost done. The last month has been different. This is the fifth Sunday, as I said, that we've not met here in this building. And, and even though it's empty physically, it is still good to be in this building preaching the word of God. And I look to the day in which we will all be back together. Our last meeting was on March 15th. We did not come back that night, and even on the 15th, we gave warnings, if you're not comfortable coming, don't come. Then things began to hasten as we saw this uh, epidemic, this pandemic, expand around the world and to our country. It involved, it involved citizens of this city. Our mayor, our governor, and our president, of course, have spoken. They've done different things because of the way our political structure is, one state may do something different than another state. That was designed by our forefathers. We may not all be on the exact same page, but we all are trying to reach the same goal of a safe and healthier society. The world has known pandemics before way worse than this. This is a bad one. We will get through it. But, but suffice to say... There has to be decision making and there has to be leadership. And God places those leaders in the place in which they are called. Just as I have been ordained of God to be a pastor and a shepherd. So good government leaders have been ordained by God because God has allowed that institution to exist. Family, church, and human government. We determined this was a public health issue that was best for society as a whole, and thus no crowd should be meeting. That could certainly cause a risk. And even when we come back, whenever that is, we will do it with caution and with extra care so that we will do our part. We determined this subject was fluid and certain things were subject to change, and, and we would change as needful and as according. We, we also know that small businesses and those that don't have all the means uh, were struggling. And we want to do our part to be a testimony, a witness, 
and a blessing and a help to those. And we've, we've done, tried to do some things beside, but behind the scenes to kind of help in different areas there because we care about this community in which God has placed South Point Baptist Church. We want to be a witness in every realm that we too want to follow God's leadership in all this. I want to close with this. In this uh, sheltering at home, I've been home a little more than normal and uh, uh, made note of a movie called Richard Jewell. And it's the, the movie was made by the conservative Clint Eastwood. And uh, it, it tracks the story. Some of you know it. Some of you aren't as familiar with it. Story of Richard Jewell. Richard Jewell was a, uh, he was a security guard at Centennial Park that was built and created for the 1996 Olympics. First Olympics, I believe, in, in the South uh, since the modern Olympics began back in 1896. This was the 100th year anniversary of Centennial Park. Uh, there were concerts go going on in Centennial Park, and he was a security guard. He noticed a package that had been placed under a bench underneath the media tower, and uh, he alerted the officials. Long story short, uh, before everybody got out of the way, the bomb went off. A lady visiting uh, for the Olympics was killed. A hundred plus people were injured. A paramedic, I think, coming to the scene had a heart attack and died, and thus chaos ensued at the 1996 Summer Olympics. For three days, Richard Jewell was a, was a hero. Because he loved and believed in law enforcement, he, he wanted to do everything he, kept, uh, he could to help, even with a little naivety in that he thought everybody that was questioning was, uh, was on his side. But, uh, and this is debatable on which side that you land on. I kind of side on the, the side that Clint Eastwood and some of the writers of a couple of books that detailed what happened is in many ways because of the media hype as the internet uh, age grew, the thing got blown out of proportion because he had some things that were suspect in terms of uh, he had he'd been fired from a, a police job. They thought that he was wanting to be a hero cop that had planted the bomb and it went wrong because he wanted to be the hero of his own story. It had happened in the 84 Los Angeles Olympics. Long story short, after three days, he went from being a hero to a goat, goat and a, sub, uh, a suspect of the FBI and law enforcement. Well, 88 days went by and uh, uh, in part of that 88, uh, Richard Jewell, uh, according to the book, was, was still naive in some areas simply because he believed in law enforcement. Then he came to realize that, yes, uh, in some respects, in, in great part due to the media and journalistic writing that was out of frenzy, that he was getting railroaded. He got a lawyer, as our system allows. He, he was able to, to go through the system, and it was very difficult for him. It was very trying for him, and in many ways it was, as he said, uh, a nightmare, and it will always be associated with that as long as he would live. But in the end, in the end, in part because of the system that we have in place, he was dropped as a suspect because he did not do it, and in many respects you could put the tag, the moniker that he was a hero. You would think after that he would never ever have anything to do with law enforcement. But no, that was not the case. Subsequent years found him and there was huge settlements uh, came from CNN and other sources uh, that had rushed to judgment. But he was back in law enforcement. Why? Because he believed in the system of rule that we have in this country. Despite what he went through, he still believed in it, and he felt like he was still doing some good. He would die, he would die at a young age of 44, but he, would, he died having been exonerated for finding the package and, and probably saving countless lives. Well, we all have a story. We all have something to do. 
We want to be good citizens of Jacksonville, Florida, the state of Florida, as Floridians and citizens in the greatest country on the face of the earth, the United States of America. I want us to pray. Father, we thank you for time in your word. I pray for those out there that are listening. Father, all our philosophy and beliefs, we do our very best for it to emanate, for it to evolve from what the Word of God says. Lord, we know the Word of God says that every man is a sinner and they are in need of salvation, that Jesus Christ provided that salvation by his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. Now, my simple prayer is this out there. I pray that the Holy Spirit would work and deal with any heart that is unsure about their eternity and where they're going to spend all of eternity when they pass. Lord, may we all realize that you are the ultimate power and from you flows all direction, all help, all government, all organizing and order, and most of all, all spirituality. We place our hands in you, thanking you, Father, for what you have done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.